All right. All right, how welcome everyone. We are going to talk now, having uh, spent a great deal of time building up to postmodernism and uh, the, its foundations in the structuralism of the early period of the 20th century, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure's uh, structuralist linguistics uh, upon which post-structuralism was built uh, and uh, rather uh, was built and then destru destroyed the foundations upon which it was laid. Uh, and we finished off last class uh, by looking at Roland Bart and his death of the author, which announced, among other things, that the very thing that was doing the investigating in the modernist project, the autonomous self, <laughs> was itself lacking in any uh, foundation in being that we could know. And I suggested to you last time that uh, this was a continuation of the death of God theology, which we can see in the 19th century. Well, now we've got to the death of man theology, which is, I think, part and parcel of the post uh, uh, 1960s uh, literary theory. So postmodernism is probably better defined in some ways or better termed as uh, the death of man. Uh, a, the only reason it's not called theology is because it's not really about uh, the uh, uh, God, but rather the one who bears his image, mankind. Um, but I, that is what I'm going to argue here today. And I also want to assert uh, something which is um, often confusing and much confused even amongst the experts, namely that uh, we live in a postmodern era. Uh, that is, from, a, uh, from the vantage point of somebody within the field, is not only anachronistic, it's simply misunderstanding the nature of the way literary theory has gone since uh, at least 20 years. Um, so I would put the postmodern post period, if you're going to set a cro chronology and a, uh, and a time period to these things, it, ex it extends, roughly speaking, from 1968 to 1998. So for 30 years, we're in the period of postmodernism. And uh, Jean-Francois uh, Lyotard defined uh, postmodernism by its resistance to meta narratives. So that was the age and the period in which uh, many of your professors would have uh, studied and uh, in which they also learned to think and learn to engage with the academic world around them, uh, those of them who are older, that is. So they still if they are opposed to postmodernism, understand contemporary problems in the light of postmodernism. But as I say, the academic world has moved on greatly since then, and uh, it's often, uh, sadly, the Christians who are the, the last to come on board with the new reality. And so I still hear people talking about the ills of postmodernism uh, in uh, Christian circles. But if you think about it this way, one of the things that one used to say in uh, those discussions of postmodernism was the inherent relativism of it. So you could have, if we use Leotard's definition for ourselves here, um, if, if there's a resistance to meta narratives, there is no unifying truth for everyone. Uh, if that was granted, then people would say, well, you can have your truth, and this is my truth. And so truth was relativized, the person that was expressing it, articulating it, understanding that. And we can even hear that regularly within uh, Christian circles. This is our narrative uh, for who we are. And that's, that's the world's narratives, or that's somebody else's narrative, and you just don't understand our narrative. Uh, the problem with this articulation is that it is fundamentally relativistic and it undermines the gospel, uh, which is true for all people, irrespective of whether they uh, acknowledge it or not, uh, because it's a truth revealed uh, from God, by God. Um, and so our, uh, our brave compatriot Jordan Peterson has been decrying the ills of postmodernism for a while, um, and I think he's probably mistaken in his identification of the nature of the problem here, <clears throat> because we don't live in an age any longer where people will allow you to have your truth and you can express yours. On the contrary, as we've noted, uh, 
Uh, it bears all the marks of a very strong ideological age, and we are being told that we not only uh, do have a truth, but it's a truth that has been revealed to us <clears throat> by people who self-identify that truth about themselves and ask us to conform to it. And so there are speech codes and there are you know, agencies that are there to enforce those speech codes. And furthermore, there are legal sanctions for not doing so. Well, these are not the marks of a postmodern age any longer. They're a very different thing. But I'll be, moving, I'll be moving on to that in some of the subsequent lectures. That's not what I'm concerned with today. What I'm concerned with today is a very interesting work written by a friend of mine now operating out at uh, Trinity Western, or he has been for several decades now, but he and most recently uh, been appointed as the uh, chair of theology. Uh, uh, I'll get the name wrong, but it's uh, J.I. Packer's chair at Regent College. Uh, his name's uh, Jens Zimmermann, and he wrote this uh, splendid work called a uh, little essay he wrote several years ago called Quo Vadis, Where To Now? Literary Theory Beyond Postmodernism. And I thought it was an excellent uh, synopsis of the problems as I see them myself, uh, more or less, and but also the way forward, which he uh, puts before us, I think is also quite uh, relevant and valid. And I will only want to amplify it in ways that are um, that occur to me uh, need amplification. I've been talking about them as I've taught this course. So to some degree, I will be recapping some of the material I taught last semester. In particular, we're going to come to Augustine's theology. Mm -hmm. Uh, as he articulated it, it in De Doctrina Christiana and also in his work on the Trinity. But uh, let me begin with uh, his question um, and uh, where to now. And the where to now uh, is more or less a return to a sort of a humanism. So if we finished off last time by saying that uh, with, with uh, Roland Barthes that the author was dead and with the author, the human, and postmodernism is uh, 30 years of meditating on the death of man and working it out in various ways uh, through identity group politics, among other things, but also various forms of identity group uh, studies that have proliferated in universities. Then the question, if those things have run their course, which I believe they have, and a new ideology has come into place, uh, and we can come back to the question of the what is uh, man, then the question is, what is the human? Uh, and this is a question that we need to urgently reconsider again. Uh, and I think Zimmer Zimmerman gives us a very good introduction to that. And so I'm just going to follow his argument for the next uh, hour or so. And, and make comments on it, but it's too rich and uh, too detailed for me to deviate from it too much. So I'm going to try and uh, follow it, summarize it, and comment on it, just going through it bit by bit. And it's not a short article, so I better get on my horse here. Um, so he says that, that what we need in our day is a return to humanism. And then the question, though, uh, arises, well, who, whose humanism is that? Whose humanism will that be? And he notes that uh, there are many uh, scholars that have written on this need for a return to humanism. One of them, uh, his name is Graham Good. Um, uh, Good, uh, and this is one of the one of the merits of Zimmerman. I find is that he he presents quite uh, charitably the arguments of those with whom he disagrees. He acknowledges their strengths. Uh, points out their weaknesses and then moves on and builds his arguments. So it's, it's exemplary in that sense. And Good writes a book called Humanism Betrayed, Theory, Ideology, and Culture in the Contemporary University. So Good is concerned with something that I myself wrote on in my own uh, thesis, which uh, later became published as a book, so Romanticism, Hermeneutics, and the Crisis of the Human Sciences. It's a real mouthful. Uh, but that is the problem of the entire university, and it's uh, the way it's been undermined by the post um, 
uh, modernist project of, of destroying the foundations of truth. But Good argues that the, 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 the dehumanizing effects of literary theory uh, result from rejecting individual freedom and also objective realism. And so he, uh, Good, presents this as largely a Franco-German uh, onslaught on Anglo-American common sense. And so it attacks uh, freedom and also realism. And I think that um, whether you want to put it in the form of postmodernism or post-structuralism or post-colonialism, post uh, what it does is he says that it denies human nature. Um, so that human personhood issue that we talked about, uh, that I talked uh, a few seconds ago about, it rejects the past, in fact, it completely ignores it, and it also neglects primary texts, all of which are correct, by the way. And uh, for good, he wants to return to the liberal humanism of our compatriot Northrop Fry, whom we've looked at already, uh, because he upholds everything that uh, literary theory he thinks opposes. So what are these things? Liberal uh, human liberty, creativity, progress, and even the very possibility of a common humanity. So these are good things. And uh, I would say that uh, what good articulates there, we will find Jordan Peterson also leaning in that direction, who I, I think uh, Peterson is a is a very good man. I admire him greatly for his courage. Uh, but he is really lar largely arguing for a return to that sort of liberal humanism. Uh, the problem that with good, and this is that something that Zimmerman identifies, and I think he does so quite rightly, is that it's sort of a nostalgic project uh, and a, just a call to return to Enlightenment rationalism uh, with its commitment to uh, uh, objective human reason and the scientific method, the you know, the strict procedures thereby. Uh, Zimmerman's uh, critique, and I, I would share this critique, is that the autonomous subject actually died because of its inherent weaknesses. It's not because uh, people somehow gave up the project, it's because it was fatally flawed. And I've talked about that repeatedly in speaking about Immanuel Kant's notion of human nature uh, and uh, the, the Copernican turn, the subjective turn, according to which the world uh, conforms to our capacities to perceive it. Uh, and I've, I've observed that in, in multiple ways, but one of them is that it gets rid of the idea of, um, of ethics based on um, consequences. And it, it replaces that with sort of deontology of the sort that uh, argues that you must obey uh, the moral law in all times and all situations, irrespective of consequences, even if you can predict them. And I've I've even heard this presented in uh, at Tyndale. In fact, I've heard it in Christian circles uh, presented at all times. You ought never to consider the consequences of your actions. You ought always to obey and to do uh, in accordance with your principles, irrespective of the situation. So let me give you an example. Um, 15 years ago or so, uh, I had a student in my class, she was a pacifist, uh, and she said what I've often heard, uh, including uh, recently by a pastor at Tyndale, <clears throat> uh, say that if a, uh, a, a robber broke into his house with a gun, uh, he not only would not seek to disarm him uh, or to stop him, uh, he would uh, allow him to do as he will because he believed in the principle of nonviolence. And that even, even though the consequence of that would be that his children, uh, his dependents, his wife, and he himself would lose their lives in the process. Uh, I think this is uh, insane <clears throat> and, it's not, and it's not remotely Christian not to consider consequences in uh, ethical decisions. But that invariably arises from this idea of the autonomous, rational subject. So this is my critique of that uh, tradition, as it's been expressed in our day, uh, is precisely that it's less Christian than they think, and it's more rooted in enlightenment rationality uh, and its autonomy of the subject, and it obeys the divine commandment, but without actually considering specific applications, which if you actually look at the Old Testament, uh, 
is cer certainly not the case. So we have the Ten Commandments, and then we have the case law applications of those Ten Commandments, and they're very specific. And so from that, we don't have, as the uh, our Anabaptist colleagues would have it, a prohibition against all killing, but rather the prohibition against murder. And then the, the circumstances are brought into consideration of that. Is it first degree intentional murder? Is it by accident? Uh, is it just what we would call homicide? Those sorts of things. And intention matters, and so do uh, the circumstances and outcomes. All of those things matter. But in the Enlightenment rationalism, they don't. And so ethics there are seriously impeded. And so the critique of uh, rationalism uh, and enlightenment subjectivity that that uh, literary theory has mounted seems to me to, to have substance and we don't want to give up on that. We can't just go back to the way things used to be prior to the 1960s. And so the rational epistemology simply isn't sufficient. So there's one theorist that he uh, brings to our attention at the outset. Uh, another is Valentine Cunningham. Uh, English scholar, uh, Christian as well. He has a book called Reading After Theory. And he also uh, celebrates the fall of theory because it, it ushers in the possibility of returning to more humanistic reading practices. And, and he recommends a uh, Eucharistic uh, uh, reading practice celebrating the presence uh, in the midst of, of, of reading. And I think it is an improvement on this. Um, both men, I think, uh, give credit, both good uh, and uh, Cunningham give credit to their, uh, uh, their criti critics. Uh, so it's a return to, uh, but, but uh, Cunningham is superior insofar as he acknowledges the advances that literary theory have actually brought. Um, so that he advocates a return to humanism, but it's a, it's a critical humanism. And I, I would have uh, said, um, again, going back to, to uh, Good's point, how about C.S. Lewis's critique uh, in The Abolition of Man of the idea of, uh, of truth shorn of beauty and goodness? Because that's what we're dealing with uh, prior to the 1960s. There was this idea of the objectivity of, of reasoning, and yet there was no objectivity of moral ethics and there was no objectivity of beauty. Those things had disappeared. So we can't just go back because um, we need uh, notions of goodness uh, and, and beauty and truth, not just truth. And good seemingly, seemingly only wants the, the truth without the goodness and the beauty. Whereas Cunningham is, is aware of the gains uh, wrought by literary theory and both he and uh, a scholar down at Calvin by the name of James K.A. Smith um, are, are quite pleased with uh, Derrida um, um, and, and what Derrida uh, contributes to all this. And I, I'm less sanguine about, their con about his contributions myself. Um, I think that everything that Derrida seems to offer, more or less, the new critics have already offered. Uh, and so did Northrop Fry to some degree that namely the, uh, the, uh, not just the autonomy of the text, but the practice of recognizing the validity of the text uh, and the need to engage with it on its own terms and in human terms, and not try and just make it an artifact that is a representation of broader cultural trends. But what he does say, and what I say, and actually what everybody agrees these days, is there's no longer such a thing as neutrality. Nobody believes in neutrality anymore. Uh, that died out, That the belief that there, it was even possible uh, died out many years ago. Uh, almost everyone recognizes that people are uh, committed uh, politically, culturally, religiously, personally, uh, however, in terms of their interests. And these interests always, uh, always uh, predispose us to look at things in a particular way. And the problem with that, of course, is that it uh, it seems to uh, beckon towards postmodernism and relative uh, views of truth. But he concludes uh, his section on Cunningham. I'm going to skip over it a little bit because I'm...
noticing that I'm uh, running a bit short on uh, time here, um, th that he says that um, reading is the slow is a slow process and a necessarily slow process, uh, and it moves towards realization and meaning and truth and and also and probably most importantly a transformative ethical result. Uh, and unlike Jacques Derrida, who, for whom every text results in an aporia, and you will have noted this word in your text there, uh, and I should comment on that. Um, unlike Derrida, uh, uh, who sees every text as resulting in an, a, a blind alley, which we can't get out of. So every attempt, Derrida says, that we have to establish truth or meaning or, or being ends up in a uh, contradicted by the way in which words are amb ambiguous and they slip and and there's uh, an, uh, an undermining of our attempts to uh, establish certainty. Um, but there was a good in that as far as um, uh, Cunningham was concerned and it, what it was was that it pointed out the fact that um, uh, our, our, even our attempts to articulate truth uh, point to the need for a broader sense of truth than the ones that we can articulate. And I think there is something in what he's saying there. I'm not wholly convinced that that is Derrida's project, but let's grant uh, that uh, that could be the intention. And I will certainly say that that is the case with human language. We don't have the capacity for objectivity. We don't have the capacity for full truth. Um, and so in order to lay hold of them, we need to appeal to revelation. That's where I would go with this. And I think that's where Zimmerman will go with this as well. But all of this then raises the question, and he does ask it, if that's the case, then whose humanism are we going to point to? And whose theory? Uh, because uh, if it's not the humanism of the Enlightenment, and it's not the humanism of the postmodernists who really don't have a humanistic basis at all. Uh, they're engaging in what uh, my former colleague at Durham University, Patricia Wall, used to say is an anti-humanistic anti theory. Um, then what form of humanism do we return to? And that is the question then. If it's not the Enlightenment's form of humanism, then what form of humanism is it? Well, um, I think that uh, here's a good quote, and it's from a man by the name of uh, Jean-Michel Rabaté, uh, and he formulates what uh, Zimmerman regards as the central question in the debate, and I'll just read it uh, verbatim here. While I agree with most of these astute remarks about the need to revise concepts of literary criticism, insofar as they deflate bombast and correct obvious exaggerations, I cannot help noticing that this problematic remains excessively literary and thus fails to touch upon the core of what I intend to understand by theory. For instance, if we may agree that a measure of common sense will put an end to projective and philosophical overinterpretations of texts, Will we have to return to the old humanism based on universal values our grandparents believed in? So this is the uh, question that he asks and which Zimmerman asks and which I think is a good question. Do we simply have to return to the 1950s in order to go forward? And the answer to my mind is most certainly no. Uh, but what we do need to do, and Zimmerman says this, Rabate says this, and I say this as well, is we need to interconnect literature, philosophy, and also theology. And, and so when he comes to redefine theory, um, he wants to see literature and, uh, and the texts upon which they meditate in an interdisciplinary fashion. And so it's not just the close reading of the text of the new critics. For the new critics, they suspended all of the concerns with hermeneutics. They simply saw themselves, they saw the text, they regarded the extrinsic matters of their 
social context or the author's social context, whatever uh, R.V. Young says here, um, the critique of the new critics has some validity that uh, even though they, they did consider those things, they didn't consider them to be too important. They were relatively insignificant. So we can't go back to the old humanism of our parents. We need to come to, uh, or, or our grandparents rather, we need to uh, consider hermeneutics going forward in a way that we'll look at it uh, fundamentally and ontologically. And so the, uh, and then we're going to look at this in terms of our old friend, Terry Eagleton. Now, Zimmerman cites a put on this course uh, by Eagleton, uh, it's called After Theory. And again, it's wrote and written post 1998. So again, it acknowledges uh, the death of postmodernism uh, amongst the literary theorists. And Eagleton himself, who was, as we've noted already, a Marxist uh, in his uh, inclinations and, and remains one to some degree, even he recognizes the need to return to some of the old humanistic values. And what he tries to do is to uh, wed Marxism with an Aristotelian framework, uh, which I find um, odd, to put, it, to put it mildly. Um, in part because it wants Aristotelian, Aristotelian thinking without Christianity. And uh, I know that uh, since the time he wrote that book, he's moved more and more uh, towards a Christian uh, position, acknowledging the importance of Aquinas and so forth. But all the same, I, I think that we don't begin by fusing Aristotle and Marx and then adding Christianity onto that. We have to begin uh, with revelation and with a, a theological understanding of the human person uh, before we then parse out where we're going to go from there. So you have to get to a foundation first, and the foundation is not Marx. Um, but uh, Eagleton in his After Theory does something which I particularly appreciate, and that is to attack pragmatism. And he has in particular view here a uh, philosopher, American philosopher the, by the name of Richard Rorty, uh, and uh, who effectively argues that doing uh, precedes knowing and precedes uh, being. So uh, as uh, he summarizes it, we do what we do because we do what we do. So it's uh, this nonsensical, uh, self-referential, uh, circular argumentation of the reason we do what we do is because we do what we do. And um, it's just simply anti-intellectual. Um, and, and Eagleton, with his typically sharp tongue, says that the, this sort of dim-witted political naivete merely colludes with the grim logic of capitalism that sells itself to the highest bidder. Um, all the same, uh, despite Eagleton's critique on this, which I think is entirely valid, by the way. Um, I think this is exactly what has happened in the Anglosphere. So while in the academy, the postmodern literary theories were at work, and while in uh, post-Cold War, there was a sense that we were beyond ideology now, and we lived in the triumphalistic age of uh, American uh, dominance, uh, and we would be able to live in a, in a better world in which there were no more ideological objections. What we saw increasingly is a thoughtless culture that was uh, increasingly consumerist and increasingly did not ask the questions of what human, human nature was, what it was for, what life was for, uh, what, the, what the purpose of meaning was in a person's life. These sorts of questions have dropped out of universities and by and large people got on with simply, uh, as he put it, selling itself off to the highest bidder. Uh, and even we can see that in politics in terms of the engagement of the West towards China with the uh, allegedly naive idea that we would sell goods to China and that China would eventually reform itself politically because they would have the financial means to uh, consider freedom. So we would, uh, in the Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, we would provide their material needs first and then all the, the higher needs would, would build up on that foundation. Uh, I just thought that I just think this was remarkably uh, 
um, short-sighted and uh, and we can see the consequences in our day i would also say that this idea of selling itself off to the highest bidder is also true of evangelicalism and it's endless skirt chasing of every new fashionable girl that appears on the horizon uh, and whether you can see it in popular magazines or in churches or even in uh, universities always trying to be hip and relevant and uh, trendy well this is just pragmatism leading uh, theology and practice. At any rate, back off, back to, uh, off my rant here. But that critique that he mounts there, I think, is entirely valid. And uh, he insists that um, on the radically hermeneutical nature of ethics. Um, and so uh, objective truth is rooted in a form of self-knowledge, uh, which is, he says, the precondition of all successful uh, living. Um, uh, the critique of this, which I think um, Zimmerman raises, is the one that I raised earlier, uh, is that he effectively still appeals to deontology, namely the uh, understanding of, um, uh, oh, I haven't even explained what deontology is. So deontology is, is a category of, of normative um, ethics that encompasses them all. All we have to do is cleave to certain uh, rules or duties, and then we will be ethical. It doesn't consider consequences. It doesn't consider outcomes. Uh, so if the Nazis come into your house and they want to gun down your children or they want to take your Jewish wife off to the death camp and they ask you where she's hiding, you will have to tell them where she's hiding because that would be, you're always sworn to be truthful and dutiful to those in the position of authority, that sort of thing, which is, of course, madness. This is crazy forms of ethics. But um, I'm afraid that uh, Eagleton uh, has not escaped that form of ethical understanding. Um, and so the, the Marxist ethics here is insufficient then to ground a proper humanistic mode of reading and a mode of scholarship. So we'll leave him off there. Um, uh, and the, the, the main reason is that he has no notion of human nature. So he has Aristotelianism, he has Marxism, but he doesn't have a robust theologically ontologically grounded notion of what human nature is. And so he can't operate with that uh, going forward. So what is the way forward then? Well, the way forward uh, is uh, not just reading, says Zimmerman, uh, hermeneutically, not just reading hermeneutically, but reading as a practice of hermeneutics. Uh, and so he, he, the way he explains this is that all of our readings are motivated by application. So it's never the case that we're simply reading a text and trying to understand it. We're always, even when we're reading, thinking and applying it to ourselves. So the mind of the author, if you will, is engaging through the written word with our minds and our minds are because they're in our bodies are engaging with our lives and they're always implicitly or even sometimes explicitly applying what we're reading to our lives and that, that's one of the reasons why people find reading uh, great books enormously enriching in their own lives because it does expand our way of looking at things they see we see things through another person's eyes and all the more so uh, when we come to uh, scripture, where we see things through uh, uh, through God's sight, uh, if we read it properly. So he raises a series of questions, I think, and these are on uh, right before, right towards the end of uh, his discussion of the way forward. These are the questions. Why should we return to Northrop Fry's liberal humanism with all its unquestioned assumptions about reason and human nature, or why should Valentine Cunningham's sacramental model of reading possess a universal claim to truth, unless it can be shown as rooted in the very fabric of reality? And these are precisely the questions that theory has taught us to ask, so it's in that sense a good thing. It's, a, it's pushing us to ask the right questions. 
So what are the answers to this question then? Well, we have to uh, approach it not with answers uh, per se, although there will be some answers, but more with let's think about how we're going to approach the question. And he suggests a few types uh, of things that we want to consider here. So first of all, as I say, reading as an act of hermeneutics. And what that means is that we have to uh, resist the assumption that we first exegete before we uh, consider application. Rather, uh, because there is no such thing as neutrality in reading. When we come to the text, we already have presuppositions. We don't come to it neutrally. We come to it with the presuppositions of our culture. We come to it with the presuppositions of our nature. We come it with it with the presuppositions, I would say, of our capacity to reason, with the presuppositions of the laws of logic, with the presuppositions of our own being uh, made in the image of God. And uh, of course, Zimmerman is going to go there as well. So exeg we can't just say, okay, first we do exegesis, and then we consider application. Zimmerman's point is we do both at the same time and we can't resist doing that. At the same time, uh, in pushing back on him just ever so slightly, I do think that there is uh, an emph uh, a necessary emphasis uh, while not totally putting aside the uh, exegesis or the application, both are there at one and the same time. So when we come to the act of exegesis, so we're reading a text, we are, I admit, thinking about how we're going to apply it and we're thinking about how it's relevant to us. At the same time, when we are reading, we are primarily uh, exegeting. And when we stop reading, we are primarily applying. But I will admit that the two are going hand in hand. But still, I, I agree with his point. So it's not just exegesis followed by application or motivated by application, but, um, <clears throat> so, sorry, uh, our readings are motivated by application. So even while we're reading, we're thinking about uh, how it applies to us. And so that's his first point. His second point is that even reflection is hermeneutical. Um, and if we acknowledge that we are radically historical, um, in other words, bound by space and time, then we also need to acknowledge that our own interpretive frameworks are always subject to revision. If we change, if the world around us changes, uh, and those conditions, those limits on our, our seeing of the world around us um, are genuinely limits, then we have to be willing to revise those limits in the light of new information. And that's what uh, hermeneutic ontolog ontology means, uh, at least Zimmerman's phrase hermeneutic ontology means. So we're not advocating um, Derrida's view, although in a way it is, but really we're advocating a, a, a way of revising our, our, um, um, our sphere of interpretation uh, and endlessly mo moving it onward. So it's, it's a little give and a take there. But thirdly, he says, the third way forward is we, we must return to a robustly theological viewpoint. And there's no dispensing with that. It cannot be that uh, the academy uh, or anyone else can proceed forward without uh, re-admitting theology into the center of the conversation about uh, engaging with reality, not just in the field of theology, not just in biblical studies, but in every, uh, every discipline. Um, because it's not just the case that uh, God created all things, and we can only understand those things in the light of the fact uh, of the of the uh, designer of the things that were made. <clears throat> we ourselves are made in the image of God. And so because of that, we can't understand things without understanding the mind of God. We can't even understand our own minds uh, properly without that. And that's a point I'm going to raise a little bit uh, later on when I come to talk about um, uh, Zimmerman's final uh, reflections himself on this point. Uh, so I, we agree, Mr. Zimmerman and I, 
on the legitimate criticism of the ungrounded trust in human reasoning that the Enlightenment bequeathed to us. Uh, I have spent several classes. In fact, I think I presented it consistently from the beginning of this course last fall to suggest that the Enlightenment mode of reasoning is uh, uh, insufficient. Its view of human nature, the autonomous, uh, rational self, is um, not only insufficient, it is incomprehensible. It makes no sense. Uh, it denies uh, an embodied human nature. Uh, it, denies, it denies the significance of history. In fact, it militates against that. It presents us as, as it were, as orphans. And I've talked repeatedly on my course uh, and in all my courses about how the literature of the Western world then regards the hero of, of, of its fictional portraits as invariably orphans. Uh, and this is pushing a narrative of the self, the autonomous rational self, which I think is simply um, impossible and, uh, and leaves us literally as orphans. We are orphaned from the past. Uh, we are, we've forgotten where we came from. And somebody who has forgotten where they came from is uh, not sure where they're going because they don't know who their identity is. So we can't go back to the enlightenment and its mode of reasoning. We have to move forward. Uh, and his suggestion is that we move forward by appealing to uh, a thinker, two thinkers. First of all, he talks about Heidegger, and then he moves on to Hans Georg Gadamer. Uh, I've talked a bit about Heidegger already, um, but I have not yet really, I don't think I've spent too much time on Gadamer. Although if you're interested again in the uh, second chapter, or is it the first chapter of my own book on this, I uh, deal with Gadamer rather extensively, quite an important uh, writer, I think. But Gadamer has a response, a uh, sort of a humanism. What sort of humanism is that? Well, he says uh, that um, he responds to the, uh, uh, the questions raised by the liberal humanists or the advocates of common sense rationality, uh, whether their view of, of reality does not end in relativism. And this is a point I made in my own scholarship. Um, if we see everything from the vantage point of history in terms of our progress, um, then invariably everything is relative to that point. All the past is only relative to the vantage point from which we are operating, which is the sort of the God's eye perspective on the past. And postmodernism simply is critiquing that that God's eye perspective actually is anything other than yet another form of relativism. It's caught up in its own historical moment. So it's it's been radicalized uh, and, and undermined. And as long as the self defines itself as autonomous consciousness, then we can't escape subjectivism. And so there is a problem. Now, Heidegger sets out to free us from the scourge of subjectivism. Uh, Gadamer continues on with that. And Gadamer is helpful because he uh, returns to something like a traditional view uh, of rationality, uh, which is uh, fused in the, uh, in the tradition from which we rise and also uh, from the uh, horizon of rationality. Uh, which is the Greek uh, word logos, uh, about which I again spoke last semester uh, at some length. Um, but here's where um, and I'm going to recount what Zimmerman says here, and I'm also going to differ with him ever so slightly here. He agrees with Hegel, both Gadamer and Zimmerman now I'm saying, that um, knowledge uh, is always self-knowledge and that self-knowledge is always uh, interpretation and for Gadamer and again Zimmerman agrees with this that self-knowledge is the goal of humanistic education it's the goal self-knowledge now to me that itself is caught up in the same hermeneutic problem from which we were seeking to extricate ourselves the goal of humanistic education is not the knowledge of self, it's the knowledge of God. Uh, 
And unless you get that correct at the front end, you end up with various problems that arise out of it. So I don't think that self-knowledge is the goal of a humanistic education. The knowledge of God is. Of course, if we do know who God is, then we will also know, know who we are. Because, of course, um, although in Genesis 1, 26, 27, it says that um, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, so to cite the text, uh, so God created man in the image of God, created he him, male and female created he them. We can see that the uh, imago, that we bear the imago day from that text. But note that it, we're made in the image of God. Whereas in Colossians 1.15, it says that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So we are, we are in the image, whereas he is the image. So if we're going to recover the knowledge of ourselves, um, which is the gain, which according to Zimmerman, according to uh, Hegel, according to uh, Gadamer, the aim of all humanistic education, to me, we first have to know who God is. <clears throat> and note that how it's put in 1 Corinthians 13, 12 as well. Uh, the famous line for now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. And I think God's knowing of us precedes our knowing of him. And when we come to know that we are known by him, it has a transformative effect on our knowledge of ourselves. So we see who we are, not by knowing who, who, what our identity is, but rather who Christ is. And by seeing Christ, we see the divine human, the perfect human in his conduct and his ethical engagement and so forth. And thereby we recover some sort of sense of knowledge of ourselves. Now, I don't think that Zimmerman would disagree with this, by the way. So it's just a, a slight difference. It's it's maybe the language that, that uh, I'm bridling out a little bit here. Uh, and so I might be quibbling unnecessarily, but it seems to me that this uh, this this phrasing that self knowledge is the goal of humanistic education, no, that's Hegel. That's that's not that's not Christian. That leads to um, uh, worldview thinking uh, and of, of a relativistic sort, and we we need to get out of that circular type of thinking. But having said that, then uh, let's go to his. Uh, three axioms that he gets from Gadamer. And unfortunately, they're all rooted uh, in self-knowledge. And so is his notion of the Trinity. But again, what I said, let's be uh, fair to Zimmerman. Uh, I think when he's talking about self-knowledge, he's assuming the knowledge of God uh, first. Um, and my only pushback then is we can't have a humanistic education without first knowing who the true human is and who we are in him. So conversion is a necessary precondition for a humanistic education, properly speaking. That's me. Back to Gadamer. Three axioms. First of them, uh, self-knowledge is always interpretation. It's never unmediated intuition. We don't have direct access to the mind of God. We're always involved in uh, reflecting on his word we're always involved in the process so there's a process there it's not we we have direct access from our mind to his mind we we receive his revelation the word of god and those words we engage with because jesus is the word of god and his word discloses itself to us in words and it transforms us uh into that same image so uh, that's but that's the first point. Self knowledge is always interpretation. It's never unmediated intuition. Uh, secondly, ethics. Truth is ethical. Here he harkens back to the point which I've been making in my C.S. Lewis class on the significance of the abolition of man. We cannot speak of tr truth and we cannot speak of education without uh, uh, acknowledging the importance of ethics not only for the students, but for the comportment of the teacher. Uh, because we not only follow words, uh, remember we're, we don't live in a deontological universe, we also consider application. Uh, 
the application of the professor to his students, the pastor to his flock, the parent to their children. There is always an ethical comportment. It's not just enough that we say, do as I say. We expect them to do as we do. That's the uh, truth, uh, the second axiom here. Truth is ethical. Um, and I think that's a well worth uh, repeating there. And thirdly, interpretation requires aesthetics. Um, and here he pulls in uh, a very important um, consideration of what um, I think he reflects on, on Heidegger here uh, and his discussion of art and also the importance of beauty in hermeneutics and the radiance, the self-attesting radiance of truth. So truth is a beautiful thing. It, it appeals to us. Uh, it's not just simply that uh, truth is a cognitive dimension. It actually has an aesthetics to it. So uh, Jesus calls himself, um, it's often translated in, in scripture as Jesus says that he's the good shepherd. But actually, it's the kalos hypomenos. He, he's the beautiful shepherd. And, and there's something of in these three axioms that he attributes to Gadamer, which I, I noticed when I was reading it, it's very interesting. His first axiom, self-knowledge is always interpretation, relates to truth. His second axiom, that truth is always ethical, relates to goodness. And his third axiom, that interpretation requires aesthetics, relates to beauty. And these three things, beauty, truth, and goodness, are all... Um, to be found in God himself and were the uh, foundational beliefs of those that uh, founded the university. So there's that. Uh, but interpretation requires aesthetics. And so he talks about the interpretation of art here. I need to get on my bike here a little bit to finish on time here. But we, uh, he, he notes that uh, the beauty is self-attesting, whereas truth you need to point to the laws of logic um, and, and forms of validity uh, or contradiction. Um, so verification, there's a process there. Whereas beauty is its own argument. It is self-attesting and it, and it reveals something. And, and here he points to um, Heidegger's term aletheia, which I talked about in a previous class. Now, the aletheia is the Greek word for truth, but Gadamer and Heidegger well, the Heidegger is the one who comes up with the idea and Gadamer perpetuates it, uh, notes that this word aletheia could also be translated as an unveiling or a, um, um, I call it, the, the German word is unverborgenheit, which I think he makes up as well. But it's, a, it's an unveiling, it's a revelation. And beauty is exactly that. If you think about beauty, it's on the surface, but the surface radiates something that lies beneath the surface. So in the beautiful, the gap between the idea of the good and the appearance of the good is transcended. And that's why beauty is such a powerful uh, motivation, uh, the, the effect of our senses. And this is why when I was talking in C.S. Lewis in that uh, discussion of uh, Till We Have Faces, the meditation on, um, on Psyche and her beauty, and her beauty was not just physical, it was the beauty of her mind she wanted to be in a place where beauty was fully realized. But it's the beautiful itself which both creates and supersedes the contrast between the idea and the appearance. And this is Gadamer's language, just as in the beautiful, the thing itself really reveals itself, even in a copy, so in the hermeneutic experience, truth has something intrinsically worthwhile about it. And so this is why I insist that what I do, even though I am the, in this field of English literature, which is not even much highly regarded in uh, Christian circles, um, that the subject matter of beauty is uh, all important and the arts, uh, because there is a, a winsomeness uh, and a, an appeal to beauty, which I think uh, pulls into it goodness and truth in a way which is, in, is powerful and persuasive. Uh, and so um, um, that, that point about beauty, beauty. And so these three axioms, self-knowledge is always interpretation, never unmediated intuition. The truth is always ethical. 
always, and that interpretation always requires aesthetics. It's not that it could have it, it must have it. Those three things, he builds on that. And then he goes, I'm going to skip over Sloterdijk and the question of humanism, although his, his point that literature, because because these men, Gadamer, Heidegger, Zimmerman, Hegel, myself, Jordan Peterson, all of us uh, in my hearing have talked about the importance of great books and the great books leading us to a, a better knowledge of the world around us, a, a deeper, richer, asking questions that we never would have thought. It, it, it really uh, gives us a fulsome life. But this man, uh, Sloterdijk, Dutch name, uh, suggests that this is elitist and it reserves knowledge for the illiterate or for the literate rather. Um, um, I think there's something true that, uh, there's something to that. On the other hand, I, I would push back and to say, um, there's nothing wrong with elitism. Unless we understand by elitism, a claim to a greater humanity. And I think that's what he's probably objecting to. And this is what most people object to. Whenever somebody appeals to a, 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 a better form of understanding, a higher, a deeper, richer understanding of the world, of how to live their lives, others will immediately draw the conclusion that they are uh, concluding from that that this is somebody claiming to be a superior human being. And I certainly claim nothing of the sort. But that doesn't um, undermine the fact that the texts do give a richer uh, experience of life and a deeper understanding and a wisdom that comes from uh, the engagement with the great books and above all with the great book, the Bible. Uh, I think it simply plainly does do that. But the proof of what Sloterdijk is uh, saying seems to me the fact that the, the Nazis, even though they're portrayed in American uh, movies as being unintelligent um, and, um, you know, brutal, savage, unintelligent, uneducated. Um, the uh, 19th century in Germany and the early 20th century, and to this very day, I would say the most highly educated people you may ever meet are the Germans. Uh, and, and yet that all that knowledge and that culture, think of the richness of the music and the and the theology and the and the uh, literary culture coming out of Germany, all of those things, and they, I think these things are indisputable. Nonetheless, they sent uh, millions to the gas chambers: Jews, uh, Slavs, uh, the uh, the Roma, um, homosexuals, uh, the handicapped, anybody that they regarded as an Untermensch because they saw themselves as the Ubermensch, uh, the Ubermenschen. Um, so culture is not going to save us. And, and, um, and I'll, I'll grant that, but I'm not going to grant that the uh, way, the critique of this is that uh, we need to reconsider the um, um, uh, evolution or, or, or the role of instinct in human nature. I'm gonna acknowledge that, but, I'm, but again, for me, uh, that's not a, a, a valid, sufficiently valid uh, critique, and it also doesn't undermine um, the need for a theological, uh, theologically grounded ethics. So let's move forward to the final uh, section here that I want to talk about, and this is um, uh, the ontology of difference, which Zimmerman observes, and which I think is also crucial to this discussion. So Sloterdijk, as we said, thinks that this notion of a recovery of humanism is elitist. It's very bookish. We don't live in a bookish culture anymore. We live in, an in the age where cultural formation uh, no longer happens through books. It happens through uh, the electronic and mass media. Let's grant the point, but I would say where the fruits of that, we need to go back to cultural formation by the word rather than by the image. Um, where will we uh, address the implicit critique that there is a dehumanization going on in this culture? Well, I think it's by returning to the Trinity. Because in the Trinity, 
remember, once again, as I said, every human being, wherever they are, at whatever stage of life they're at, bears the image of God, every single one of them. And Jesus Christ uh, took on uh, our image, took on flesh in order to atone for all of those who repented of their sin. And, and he died for sinners, and sinners includes all of those same human people. So there's no sense that there's such a thing as a worthless human life. God didn't think so himself. But all the same, there's still a sense of a need to say more on that. And the ontology of difference that arises from the Trinity, I think, is the way forward. And I remember last semester talking about the significance of personhood in the light of the Trinity and the doctrine of personhood as being a foundational um, element of, of Western culture that allowed for the notion of human dignity and human freedom, uh, human rights even, these things uh, arise only from the idea that there is a sanctity to the human person because he or she bears the image of God. And a, and a recognition that we are under God's law and under his rule and reign, all of those things, and therefore our own institutions, however powerful they are, are ultimately accountable to him. And therefore, since they're ultimately accountable, they ought to be accountable now. All of these things play themselves out as a consequence of Trinitarian discussion. So the ontology of difference. Well, the ontology of difference is just basically this. There is only one God. Um, there is only one God. On the other hand, there are three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The three together are God. Um, this idea that, that God is one and also three uh, is a paradox insofar as it seems to, it's either, it's either one or the other. But the Christian assertion is that the, the uh, uniform nature of God and the Trinitarian nature of God uh, are valid because the both the unity and the trinity are equally ultimate the one and the many uh, this was something that the ancient world could not solve by the way the problem of the one and the many you should look that up by the way the problem of the one and the many as a philosophical problem of reconciling the idea that everything seems to be united there's a common being there are common standards of truth they apply in every situation to all contexts uh, that's the god of the philosophers. The philosophers agree on this. It's there in Plato, it's there in Parmenides. Being is ultimate reality, according to Parmenides. On the other hand, that seems to deny the uh, the uh, multiplicity of human experience, the, the reality of different beings, so different persons. Uh, and, and so people are regarded as having uh, being relatively insignificant in the ancient world. And so they permit slavery and they permit uh, um, uh, death um, by the hands of the authorities on the basis of that authority without any regard for their human rights. But the doctrine of the Trinity, um, I think, su suggests that even the individual person has worth and value there. And so here when he, he uh, teases out his uh, ontology of difference. He is effectively stating that the Trinity is at the heart of reality. And so the three distinct persons in the Trinity as one deity present us with an ideal of, of being in communion. This is another aspect of it. We find our human nature not only through self-knowledge, but through engagement with other individuals. That is part of the process here. And so even his three um, statements here as the future of human uh, uh, neo-humanism, as he calls it, I, I don't like the formulation. Uh, Self-knowledge then, but I'll repeat them, three of them. Self-knowledge, in brackets, truth, requires ethical transcendence. Well, he's already said that. Uh, this is an this is a knowledge uh, outside of ourselves, and or rather an objectivity that resides outside human consciousness. Um, and he appeals to the um, Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who I commend to you as uh, terrific on this subject and also ter terrific on the subject of aesthetics. 
uh, wonderful stuff. Um, and the only reason that um, um, what holds true in Gadamer, no, Zimmerman's humanism is because God is at the heart of reality. And here I'm going to quote then. If one does not wish to fall back into idealism or into collective sociologism, to sink into materialism and hedonism, or to break oneself on the absolute limits of the thou, the thou as hell, according to Sartre, then the only path open is the Christian path, which can att attribute endless value to the human thou because God has attributed and truly granted this value to him in the act of election and in the death on the cross. And this is possible only if the I, thou, we relationship has an absolute divine worth and dignity in the triune being of love. So God in the flesh establishes language and communication uh, not as a loss of transcendence, which is the way Derrida frames it, but as the foundation for reflection. So this is really important. So when Jesus says that I am the truth, It indicates that understanding begins in a social rather than in a rationalistic or a scientific category. When he says, I am the truth, he says it to his disciples. So there's a, dis a disclosure there. It's, there's a social aspect of it. It's not an individual uh, in a laboratory autonomously uh, uh, coming to this. And the uh, incarnation is God's self-revelation. Um, now here it seems to me that uh, what I said last semester about uh, Augustine is is really valuable uh, in relation to uh, the human mind being the image of God. If you recall, and I'm sorry I'm bringing this up here at the very tail end of the lecture, but I wanted to uh, briefly comment on that. Um, the idea that that um, when in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, when God speaks of us being made in his image, what is that what is that image constituted of? It's not a physical body. Um, that's that's what some like the Manichaeans charged Christians with thinking. That's an anthropomorphism. Um, rather, it's the inner man. Um, it's it's the mind. it's the it's the capacity for, uh, understanding God and relating to him through words it, it clearly has an aspect but this but the it's an inner man rather than the outer man now this pushes us in the direction sometimes of, of thinking in quasi platonic terms but I, I don't think that that's what's intended here it's more the relational terms of of an image bearer to the one in whose image uh, we are made um, so there's a hermeneutical aspect to this. So this is his second point. Self-knowledge, the truth, is hermeneutical. And remember Augustine's uh, question when he was asked, when he was posing the question to himself, what, uh, who he is, uh, uh, he couldn't answer the question. And he said the only one who could answer the question of who, who he was was the one who made me. And he said, I don't know, God, who I am. You know, you made me. And so the hermeneutical question invariably has to get thrown back on the one who made me in order to understand who I am, which is why I said we don't get out of the hermeneutic circle of self-knowledge without first God telling us who we are, and we only see who that is by looking to his son revealed to us. So the incarnate logos that configures the reality in which we live and move and have our being. Finally, self-knowledge requires aesthetics. Well, this is just repeating the three things he said earlier, to my knowledge. That all uh, knowledge requires both uh, a truth dimension, which is hermeneutical, and ethical dimension, which considers the, the moral attributes of God and our moral attributes in uh, re relating to him, and finally, an aesthetic dimension. And um, I, I talked about this already, but I think it's, it's simply uh, powerful, and we need to recover the sense and the importance of beauty, not just in the arts, but in the university in order to um, reconnect to um, uh, our fundamental humanness.
And uh, Balthazar's aesthetic here, I'm going to quote this passage, which I think uh, Zimmerman does, which is simply splendid. Uh, and here it is. We are confronted in the incarnation simultaneously with both the figure and that which shines forth from the figure, making it into a worthy, a love-worthy thing. Similarly, we are confronted with both the gathering and the uniting of that which has been indifferently scattered. It's gathering into the service of the one thing which now manifests and expresses itself and the outpouring self-utterance of the one who is able to fashion by himself such a body of expression. By himself, I say, meaning on his own initiative and therefore preeminence, freedom, sovereignty, out of his own interior space, particularity and essence, here exist at the same time both interiority and its communication, the soul and its body, free communion within the constraints and intelligibility of language. So language is, a, uh, is the surface of things. The thought is the inner, the inner part of it, just like a, a, we have a word in our mind before it becomes a word on our lips. In the same way, the incarnation is one with God and he can also be uh, the divine human being. We talked about the significance of that last semester when we were looking at um, uh, Augustine's De Doctrina here. But that's where uh, uh, Zimmerman concludes here uh, with that uh, idea here and he applies it and concludes it. And his argument, he concludes with these words. And I'll just read his conclusion because I think it's, it's quite good. I hope to have shown that theory means, first of all, the examination of worldview issues, more specifically ontological issues that underlie our belief in the value of literature and close readings. If we define theory in this way, it must be seen as indispensable to any literature department with a sound curriculum. Theoretical reflection is important if we desire our literature classes to impinge on the abiding existential questions of humanity. I have also argued, says Zimmerman, for retaining the label of humanism in some sense, be it as neo-humanism or in another form, because of my conviction that the humanities remain the best discipline for reflecting on what it means to be human. With the critics of humanism, however, I agree that we must maintain a real and lively dialogue with other fields of inquiry. We must work hard, in other words, to be interdisciplinary without relinquishing detailed knowledge in our particular field. And we must strive continuously to rearticulate why we do literature. We must do theory. And then finally, I have suggested the ontological questions posed to theory by the current interest in ethics, transcendence, and self-knowledge are most fruitfully answered with the help of theological considerations. If we approach the reading and teaching of literature, art, and media, indeed all reflection in the humanities by addressing foundational questions with an interdisciplinary attitude, <coughs> with the participation of religion and with the enduring enthusiasm for the intoxicating power of language, the future of theory promises to be very exciting indeed." End quote. So that's where he leaves it off. I would just add to his comment there that this uh, is not just true of literature and theory, it is important for the recovery of the humanities as a whole. The thing that uh, uh, was of interest to Graham Good at the outset, which I think will also be of interest to Zimmerman, but he is speaking more from the expertise of his discipline. But it most certainly is a very urgent need in our day, and I, I hope you found this helpful, and uh, we, we can talk about this offline uh, in another venue at another time. Thanks.